Seven, so I'd like to call this meeting of the Southern Falls School District Board to order. And please note attendance, Denise. Thank you all for coming, everyone. It's nice to see the gold and blue jackets out there. It's very cool. <laughs> um, one of our board members, Irv Stadley, is working out of town, so there's, there's a chance he might call in for Skype. We're <clears throat> hoping he does. Um, but we'll, so if he happens to chime in, that's what that's about. Um, and Mr. Chair, I, I just sent him a text, so if I pick up my phone and answer a text, it's, okay. it's Irv. It's not. Me getting in order for a little bit of bread to bring home. Okay. Okay, moving on to discussion items. First off, state FFA convention at Silverton High School. Sarah MacArthur and FFA members. I'm Janelle Kennedy, the vice president. I'm Jake Johnson, the treasurer. I'm Caitlin Towery, the president. I'm Lawson Kizzy, the sentinel. I'm Carson Zollinger, I'm the secretary. I'm Ryan Kinsey, the reporter. And I'm Sarah MacArthur, I'm one of the two advisors, and Scott Towery is um, doing some other FFA events tonight, so I'm going to have. So before we start, we just want to thank you for letting us be here and share a little bit about us and our organization. Can you help? Um, just for some background, in case you are, any of you don't know, like FFA was founded in 1928 by 33 farm boys, and now it's the biggest youth organization, like student-led in the world. And with over half a million members and like 6,000 ish in Oregon. Yeah, and a little bit about what state convention is about. Um, it's for the highest competitions in the state, so like all the kids that have uh, made it from districts and se sectionals move on to state, and then that's where we host all of our competitions. And we also have uh, workshops from people all over Oregon. They come talk about communication or, or just issues in agriculture, all, all kinds of stuff like that. And it's also uh, to elect new state officers and uh, dismiss the old ones. Like Megan Stadley from Silverton, she'll be having her retiring address on Friday evening. So. And State Convention is the first weekend of spring break. It's on the 20th through 23rd. And we're expecting 2,000 people, 1,300 are members and advisors, and then 700 are sponsors. Oh. And so then on that, there will be a lot of visitors obviously in town, and so one of the things we want to do is make the public aware of this big event and s mainly talk to businesses and restaurants just to let them know that um, we've gone, we went to the chamber and we talked to them about uh, a lot of the business owners about like when the like times when the kids will be let free or when they have a free time so maybe they'll go get food or whatever just so they're aware. And also the community, like around Silverton High School, all the houses we're gonna go on uh, Thursday. Thursday, and we're gonna go to the doorsteps and let them know that there's gonna be an event. Plants, they're not yeah. surprised. Yeah. We're gonna have some company for a few days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's pretty much like our state tournament. It's a pretty big deal for us, and it's kind of cool because we get to expose our local agriculture and what our area has to offer. So. And then I'll bring a little bit about some of the planning that's going on in the background. Um, our alumni organization has been huge in raising the money required to put on the convention. And we have tremendous community support, and so we like to extend thanks to you for allowing us that extra day. They'll be moving in the stage that Wednesday, so we have a production company from Southern Oregon that's bringing in the full sound and stage. And if you're interested in coming to check out convention, um, you can ask Andy, and I can make sure that you have passes to come in. And, like they mentioned on Friday night, Megan Stadley's giving her retiring address, and that'll be pretty impressive. Um, that'll be a nice night to be there. A lot of local, local people will be there. So, um, and we've raised the alumni maybe close to, it's probably pretty close to forty thousand dollars in support of the convention, and and we have lots of local tours to show off the agriculture. As the kids are saying, Ben Rue is going to perform a concert that the alumni is paying for at the fest hall on Saturday night, and so doing a lot of things to kind of celebrate, celebrate the kids and their success and the leadership that they're going to bring. I'm excited. So we're, our purpose here tonight is just to say thank you, which is some faces in front of you, and um, <laughs> like give you a chance to ask questions if you have of kids or myself. Have anything coming up? I don't have a question, but I know you're looking for volunteers for judging, so yeah. anybody you have time on Friday or Saturday? We do. There's everything from public speaking to um, job interviews and marketing plans. Kids do ag issues, presentations, so a lot of business-related things. So, yeah, we would 
Yeah, we have 95 judges that we round up for that just that yeah. our local area needs to provide. So big crew of judges as well. Thanks, Paul. Well, most of, most will be taking place in the gym then. The big sessions will. There will be two sessions a day. Those are the general sessions. Uh -huh. um, that's kind of the accumulation of the awards. But this public speaker will be in the auditorium, and we'll use the classrooms throughout the schools. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. How far, how far out are people having to stay? Because obviously not a lot of hotels. I'm just curious about that. Everyone in Salem mostly. Yeah, probably. We tried hard to. Well, um, local chapters. I think we book a hotel about a year out, so uh, the downtown hotel and the garden were booked uh, a year yeah. from last convention. Wow. So. They're, probably yeah. quite, they're probably quite a ways away. <coughs> Even when they're at OSU, yeah. they have, have chapters staying in Salem. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So yeah. Well, tents on the but I think some of the cool things, there are some chapters coming from way east. We have chapters way up in um, Cove and LaGrande and, yeah. and all up in that area too, and Burns. and. A lot of them will head to the coast while they're here, mm -hmm. take an extended mm -hmm. for the first time to see the beach, which is kind of oh, kind of cool when yeah. you think of that. So, we don't have a road trip this year, so we're kind of excited. It's <laughs> a lot of work on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know which one. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> what, what days of the week is it again? Just, Friday through Monday. Friday. Okay. The beginning of spring break. Yep. Yeah. 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 That's very cool. So the, the concerts up in Mount Angel then? The yeah, festival? the best hall on Saturday night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Very cool. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. That's mm -hmm. going to be a good good thing for our school district and, and community. for you guys and the yeah. whole community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. yeah. Yeah, it's a good feel good. When we get it all over with, it'll be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It'll be a lot of fun when it's Looking back. <laughs> 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 no, it's, it's good. We're, we're looking forward to it. The stage, the production is pretty amazing that they have lights and sound and they'll have motivational speakers and all kinds of fun things to do. And we've got tours highlighting some of the, the agony area too, up to the garden, of course, and the falls and some of those big partnerships with those people too. Good. <coughs> very cool. And, any other questions? Well, thank you very much for coming and filling us in. This is going to be thank exciting. You. Thank, thank you. you. We'll be in conditions. Yeah. Yeah. But thanks if you want to come for or see a session, um, if that's all right, Absolutely. Mr. Melinda, yeah, we right. can get you a Or you through Denise and we'll set it up. Yeah, we'll have you too. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank thanks you. for coming. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Tim, I'm going to check again. Herb said to try it. Okay. He says he thinks he's ready. <clears throat> there he is. Well, that's just his picture. Well, it's ringing. That's a good sign. Come on, press the button. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Do it one more time. Through. Yeah, it's going through on this end. Uh, I'm not certain why he's yeah, he's not picking up. So if he can try, and it'll, it'll ring. And if okay, I, we hear it ringing out. Then we'll okay. Okay. Our second discussion item tonight um, is about a declaration of a vacancy school board in Zone Five, which is the zone I was elected in. I have a little statement I'm going to read because this kind of came up recently, and I want to clarify clarify this for the public. A question came up last week from a community member concerning when a board member moves out of their elected zone, how long they can continue to represent that zone. This relates to Zone 5, which I was elected in, but moved into Zone 1 last year. After consulting with OSBA, it's clear that the state statute allows a board member to, to serve until the next district election. I had thought that a person could serve out the remainder of their term, but was wrong about this. I want to thank this community member for bringing this to our attention so it can be corrected. 
So since I've moved from Zone 5 to Zone 1, we can now declare a vacancy in Zone 5 for the upcoming election in May. And this will be an action item for the whole board to approve tonight. That's something we're supposed to vote on as a board to declare Zone 5 vacant. Um, this will initially be a two-year term to finish the remainder of my term, but then we'll go back on the regular four-year cycle. The sign-up deadline with county elections is March 12th. And also, since Zone 1 is also vacant for this election, Julie, Julie Zone, she announced last, the last meeting she's not going to run again. Um, and since I live in Zone 1 now, I will be running for the Zone 1 position. So I um, just wanted to clarify that. Like I said, it's an action item. Um, we're going to add, as an, add it as an action item for the whole board to declare Zone 5 vacant for this coming election in May. So any discussion on this or any comments or anything? No, I think it's all a surprise to us because um, we've had this happen before. I don't think this has come up. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It took OSBA a little digging to, yeah. to make sure how to um, to make sure the right way to go about it too. So, but that's fine. Um, again, thank you to that community member for bringing it up so we could make it right. Tim, if I can chime in, we yeah, go ahead. Advisory ahead. County elections, uh, the, uh, the likelihood of this occurring this evening and, and uh, this notice being made. And, and so uh, the elections office, uh, it was a bit of a head scratcher for them as well, but they are working closely with the Secretary of State in getting it listed in the voter's guide appropriately as a two-year term Okay. Uh, to continue, Okay. to finish your term. Go okay. Ahead. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay, third discussion item, 2015-16 budgeting, state school fund levels impact, board budgeting goals. And, and yeah, I'll, I'll begin the conversation with, with just some information for you, or at least to allow you to have the conversation. Uh, each of you received this evening a copy of, a, it's a draft copy, uh, and, uh, information related to three levels of, of funding that have been either just proposed or discussed at, at the state uh, level. Uh, and as you're all aware, we, we're in the middle of, uh, of a legislative session, and part of this legislative session, of course, is approving a two-year budget for K-12 education in the state of Oregon. Uh, prior to his resignation, the governor had proposed a, uh, a two-year education K-12 budget of uh, a little over $6.95 billion. Uh, co -chair, uh, education committee co-chairs have proposed a $7.235 billion uh, K-12 budget. Uh, and as you'll see on this handout, that 7.235 billion budget is, is there with some with a little narrative uh, about it from a state level standpoint. Uh, but in conversation and, and I think more advocacy at the state level, especially from uh, organizations such as COSA and OSBA, there is some real effort, energized effort to help the, the community of the state to help the legislators understand that <coughs> the 7.235 billion is not sufficient to, to fund education into uh, through the next two years. And so you'll see two additional op options that have been discussed by both of those organizations and others, and that's a 7.5 billion uh, threshold and a 7.875 billion uh, K-12 threshold and some language specific to those. So the purpose of this information tonight is to help to um, begin a, a, continue, I should say, conversation with you to make you aware of, of this information, to discuss a little bit about what local impact, or at least what we anticipate local impact to be, and Scott and I have been working on some figures specific to that that I'll share in just a moment, uh, and use that to transition into uh, your discussion around what some of your priorities are for this budgeting season, especially as we move into uh, work with your budget committee in, in April. So, uh, with that said, I want to put some figures on, on the whiteboard uh, that should help with this conversation. And, and I'm going to use the three figures on your sheet as a, as a, as a jumping off point and a place to begin. Uh, first of all, I, I have all three of the funding levels up there. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that the state uh, legislature is going to land on one of those three funding levels. They can land wherever they believe is entirely appropriate. But since those are the three talking point areas, I think it's important for us to figure out what that could look like for us as a school district. Using some assumptions, and I'm going to write these assumptions down on the bottom first. Uh, assumptions around uh, full day kindergarten, uh, which is about an $800,000 impact for this district. 
uh, some assumptions around uh, cost of living adjustments uh, for our classified and licensed group. If you recall, we, we settled on 2% on for license for next year and 2.25 uh, for classified. If you were to combine those with the uh, step adjustments and increase in insurance, we're talking about a 4.9% package, is that right? <coughs> Total Scott, mm -hmm. so for uh, our employees uh, for an impact for next year. Uh, if you take a look at um, additional expenses, and again, some of these come from recommendations at the, at the state level, let's say from uh, OASBO or from COSA, 3.1% uh, uh, increase for things, uh, in, uh, supplies, uh, expenses, equipment, and so forth. Um, and we, we are, even though I think we, we can accurately state that we anticipate relatively flat uh, enrollment, uh, we're anticipating anywhere from 0.5 to, to 1% uh, of an enrollment increase next year, which is really more of an impact on the revenue side, but generally speaking, I believe the enrollment will remain flat in this district for another year. Slight tick up, of course, with, with full day kindergarten, but even with that, we don't anticipate it to be more than 1%. We'll know for certain as the numbers start coming in. And then, um, this one I know is a very important topic to the board each year, and that's what your budgeted fund balance is. And I, I'm gonna put it up here where I can write a little bit better. But your budgeted fund balance is what you believe you'll have in the bank so to speak, uh, at the beginning and, and at the end of the year. And, and if you recall, over the course of the last five and six years or so, you've tapped into that fund balance uh, in order to sustain, just to stay, sustain yourself as a district. Uh, the current uh, fun budgeted fund balance is around 6.7%. The, the, the figures that I'm about to put up here from a local impact uh, and again, we're making an assumption based on what we think that you will want as a board, but jumps that up to about 8%. It's an increase in your fund balance of about $500,000, give or take. You, uh, you have operated in the past, prior to five or six years ago, you have operated at a budgeted fund balance, balance level, getting closer to the 6.7 and 8% range has actually been a little bit higher in some of your very healthy years in the past. But this is, again, relying upon what I believe the board is gonna ask, and that's for an increasing uh, fund balance to help you do just that, remain in good health as a, as a school board. Uh, now, the budgeted fund balance is typically less than what your actual fund balance is at the end of any given year. Uh, and those are, we can, we can re rely upon fairly accurately uh, when we take a look at the audited figures. And I just want to share those with you for a moment. I think it gives you even a better reference of where you ended up. <coughs> if you take the last, the last few years, 2014, current audited, or just last audited year, you actually came in at about six point or excuse me, 9.36% uh, as an actual ending fund balance in your general fund. 2013, you were at 9%. Uh, 2012, you were at 11%. 2011, you were 11.81. So uh, again, you can see that there's been clearly a drop in, in what the actual was. And, and also keep in mind too that your uh, many times your, your use of reserves has a bit of a delayed effect on the audited figures. So to, to see a 9% here means that a decision was made you know, one or two years prior that ultimately resulted in that audited uh, figure a, a couple of years later. So uh, this figure was much higher than, or not much higher, but higher than 12 and even 13% at one point, even like eight or 10 years ago. Uh, generally speaking, and relying upon information that Scott has received from OASVO, the figure of, of around 10% is a pretty common figure uh, for a number of school districts. That's anecdotal. I don't know that we can say that's, that's a data-driven or quantifiable decision in a document, but when we speak with other business managers and other superintendents that the actual uh, ending fund balance uh, is, is around 10% and seems to be uh, the, the reality of where we are today as an education system. It used to be our target. System. It used to be our target. Okay. That's good to know. So with that said, <clears throat> taking all of these assumptions into mind, 
And coming from a 20 to 30,000 foot level, knowing that we haven't gone through the budget development process yet, if we rely upon the $7.235 billion revenue figure over the course of, of two years, uh, the first year will leave us at about $1.645 million short uh, of revenue. It's about a 5% hit. We dealt with larger hits in the past. And this, by the way, assumes that we, we operate full day kinder. If you were to make a distinction and say, well, we just can't afford full day kindergarten, then you can cut that figure in half. The deficit will be about $800,000. If the revenue approved by the legislature is at 7.5 level for Silver Falls School Bishop, we're talking about a deficit of about $855,000. With these assumptions in place, now keep in mind this jump alone from 6.7 to, to 8 percent is uh, at least $500,000. So depending upon where the board wants to land with your comfort of, you know, of budgeted fund balance, you can surely make a pretty significant impact on these just with one decision alone. That's where you want to put your fund balance. If the uh, the revenue comes in at 7.875, we estimate uh, to be in the black about 264. Uh, $1,000. Andy, just a point of reference, the last my name, what, what was the figure for state funding? It was with, with the uh, with the added uh, uh, piece uh, that was pursued by the governor, the, the PERS um, uh, re uh, reduction of the PERS legislation, we were at 6.75, I believe, Wally. 6.65 or 6.75. Again, keep in mind this is a pretty big price tag right here when you talk about across the, the state of Oregon. It's $220 million anticipated um, for, for full day kindergarten. Uh, and keep in mind that you've had some incredibly uh, flexible and understanding associations, both associations over the last five or six years. So the fact that we landed on a three-year agreement and that we were able to settle on 2% cost of living adjustment, both sides agree, is, uh, is a very good place to land. Uh, and we're not talking about a huge increase in expenses of 3.1%. I mean, things go up and inflation is inflation. So with that said, again, this is, this is still very early and, and we're, we're hoping to to have some additional clarity from the legislature over the course of the next few weeks. We have a budget to put together, though. And uh, from Scott's perspective and my perspective, we're going to have to begin here with the principals as they begin to form their budget and what that looks like. So at least that they're placed in a position where uh, we can staff and we can uh, fund our schools at this level if, if it was necessary. But as you can tell from the information on the sheet that I gave you, that. Um, 7.235 is referred to as budget cuts and a dilemma, mm -hmm. uh, and it is a dilemma. So, uh, you know, there's there's a still a certain level of optimism out there, and I think the op op optimism, um, you know, if a person had to speculate, is going to produce an outcome that is generally supportive of schools. I think that's kind of the feeling at the legislative level right now, but there's still a lot of work that yet, is, has yet to be done, and, and we have to plan in a way where um, we're not going to set, set ourselves up for any problems, that's for sure. So there's some information to begin your discussion around goals, uh, or, or if I can answer any questions, I should be yeah. happy Andy, who is the, so the source of this? I think I missed, missed that. Who put this? Yeah, uh, COSA distributed this information, but it's with some collaborative work with OSBA and COSA folks. Has there been growth in other areas of the state? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm, maybe, I, maybe I missed something, but the last biannual was 6.7. And yet, our worst case scenario, you know, just the 7.2, but what, how does that result in less money for us? If there's more money, I mean, 7.2 is more than 6.7, yet we're 1.6 million, that means 1.6 million less for us. You, you see what I'm saying? I'm I, trying to think why I, I that. Like, grant, I know costs go up, but yeah, I'm just Well, student, to, student growth is a in, 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 too. in other areas of the state, not yeah, here. significant student growth. But got, got it. So other, it's been sucked to other areas of the state. Okay. Yes, even though our, our enrollment is remaining flat, 
it's not remaining flat. Right. So, they, so, the, so the, 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 the dollars per student throughout the state are going down. Got it. And is the all day kindergarten affecting that as well, as far as dollars available? Because everybody's, if everybody's implementing all day kindergarten, that's mm -hmm. More dollars being distributed. Yes, and there, there has been some uncertainty about that discussed recently. That The figure that is estimated is a $220, $20 million. Uh, and the full day kindergarten impact was first estimated at the 16 to 18,000 student range. Mm -hmm. But some preliminary figures, excuse me, that some uh, uh, current figures based upon conversations with communities indicate that that figure could be more like 19 or 20, even 21,000 kids. So, oh. So if, if that, and we won't know that for certain until after <clears throat> kindergarten roundups across the state of Oregon until we see who, you know, the whites of their eyes on the first day of school. Uh, yeah, for sure. So. Is, there, is there a population increase in the state? And then you're seeing a lot of that, you would see that at the lower end, so kindergarten you see a bunch of them. Yes, and I think the other, the other uh, piece is the, um, is uh, parents that may have otherwise kept their children at home for another year instead of paying for daycare yeah. for another year or choosing yeah. to place their children in full day kindergarten. Why not? That's the belief. All day. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Discussion about more <clears throat> board goals, what we would kind of like to possibly see. Anybody? Well, it doesn't look like a time to be adding things, but. Um, <laughs> Um, no. We talked going to be what you don't want to say. <coughs> I mean, I, it would be entirely natural for the board to say, Andy, don't even touch furlough days if, if, you know, if things get bad or, or words to that effect. Uh, yeah, we could surely look at lots of options. You, we talked about in adding an SRO in conjunction with the police department. What was the cost on that? Uh, $90,000. Now you have a, a joint city council school board meeting coming up in a month and uh, would not be unreasonable to have a conversation about that to see if there's any flexibility on the city's part to to even fund uh, more than, than the 25% that this proposal was. Have principals went in and all on that? On their feelings on that versus, I mean, how that fits into the whole budget thing? Because I know last time we were talking about adding an SRO, it was when things were even tighter than they are now. <clears throat> and they said we would prefer to have that money go into the classrooms. Yeah, they, they haven't had this detail of conversation. Okay. Okay. It's coming to you first. Okay. Okay. And frankly, if we're looking at cuts, I'd certainly prefer a furlough day over mm -hmm. cut, cutting features. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I would agree with that. I think, especially with the new requirements and stuff coming up, I think maintaining staffing levels and maintaining programs as much as we possibly can is really important. Mm -hmm. I would rather see our, our, end, <coughs> our ending fund balance at 6.7 Rather than at eight, if we, if there was a push pull between those two, yeah, I would rather see a little lower ending fund balance and the no staff cuts to at least keep things the way they are. I mean, it'd be nice if we could increase some and you know get more help in classrooms and stuff, but that's yeah. probably not going to happen. I we could increase it. I guess that'd be my priority. However, for the other end of the spectrum, I think we ought to be working on getting our fund balance up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and possibly looking at an SRO if we could mm -hmm. afford that. I think that would Absolutely. be a really good benefit, especially when the when the city said they could um, serve every school in the district. That's that'd be really. I think that'd be a good thing. Is a single furlough day roughly equivalent to a hundred thousand dollars? Yeah, I, I know that was a number I heard probably four years ago. Years ago. So we'd have to recalculate that. The only, well, it'll be at least that. Yeah. And when does when does the state come out with some firm numbers? Uh, by the time we adjourn. Yeah. Okay. What day? July. Some of you may have heard otherwise. David, maybe at OSBA, you, you may have heard. I know there was an interest in the past of trying to get schools some numbers by even first of April, if possible. Uh, but I haven't heard that kind of chat recently. Have you? I haven't. It's everything that everything that I've heard. Um, I mean, we're at early on in the legislature, but it is. <clears throat> excuse me. It is a solidly democratic legislator legislature. Um, they're all committed. Uh, the majority are committed to funding education at a higher level 
The governor's uh, budget has always come in very low. I mean, it's kind of dead on arrival because it's so low uh, with this legislature and, and especially with the increased uh, Democrat majority. So I, you know, it's hard to pro prognosticate, but I think that funding levels will certainly be higher than the governor's proposal. And <clears throat> probably my guess is just based on what I've heard and what I've heard talked about is to be somewhere in the middle, the 7.5 billion. It's possible it could go higher. It just depends. Um, the, the one thing about it is with the higher numbers, there's a great deal of discussion about targeting that money. So school districts won't have the kind of dis discretion yeah. um, <clears throat> that we might hope for to put the money in different places. It may be targeted for early childhood or, or kindergarten or specific areas where you have to spend it. So. You get the money, but you get strings attached. So, it's an interesting predicament for schools, isn't it? Yes. It really is. It's, yeah, it's really very difficult to plan for uh, appropriate. Yeah, same really same thing every every recycle, yeah. every buy every two because we don't have an especially stable, uh, predictable way of funding. Yeah, public education. So it's too bad. Something we all need to work on. So we have a lot of discussion in the session about the rainy day fund. Again, I don't know where that's going. Um, <clears throat> there's discussion about the kicker, of course, ending the kicker or reducing it so that we can create a rainy day fund and get the state off of the roller coaster uh, education funding cycle. Um, we just don't know yet. We don't know how far those initiatives will go and whether they'll be successful. Mm -hmm. So there are people talking about it and working on it though. Okay, anything else on this? <coughs> if you have some additional insight, please send me an email and, uh, you know, as we, as we <coughs> meet, the administrative team uh, prepares the budget, of course you'll have plenty of opportunity for input in subsequent meetings in the budget committee, but having your insight now makes a big difference, so thank you. Okay. So rather than prepare, we're going to prepare, my assumption is that we're going to prepare several different scenarios, right? Yes. Like basically three, two, three budgets? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And start on the low end, David, <coughs> and then we'll have a big add back list or at least a second scenario okay. with, let's say, the 7.5 level. Good. Okay. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Selection of architect for the Schlater project. We had some information in our packet about this. There was a a selection committee that met um, <clears throat> met to, with some architects and went through the whole procurement process and came up with recommending DAWA IBI. Um, Andy, do you want to? You have a copy, a copy of the summary score sheet uh, in front of you, or was given to you in your packet. Uh, I, I believe it was, a, it was a very objective process. We had uh, lots of interest in this project. Uh, believe that the outcome is, is one that, that supports your pursuit and I believe that in this case uh, DAWA IBI group, as you can tell even by the, the ratings, is, is, a, uh, is a sound, uh, solid architectural firm which will um, serve this district well and has actually served this district well in the past, as many of you are aware. Uh, I believe it's a recommendation that is, is solid and, and objective and was done in, a, in an impartial and appropriate fashion. Can you explain that a little bit, kind of the process and the criteria that was used? Sure. The uh, uh, a full um, uh, re request for qualifications was published in the, the Daily Journal of Commerce and also on the district website uh, to seek qualify architects uh, and engineers for uh, this project. And, and actually, it could have been architect as an engineer or engineers with an architect. I think either way would have been appropriate. Uh, and that was published for a couple of weeks, I believe. Uh, and then uh, there was a mandatory pre-proposal meeting held here, uh, which drew quite a crowd, uh, and including some interested subcontractors who came in and also asked some general questions and, and received the, the, uh, the available information. Uh, and then there was a deadline for proposals. When the proposals were submitted, uh, a committee was convened to evaluate those based upon scoring system that was published within the RFQ. Uh, that, that list was narrowed down to two finalists. The two finalists were interviewed by the same team and then using a, a secondary scoring system and that scoring system determined the final recommendation. Where are the evaluators chosen? 
how were they chosen? Yeah. We, we attempt to get some diversity of, of people who will be working with these individuals who have some experience in their, in their uh, background and in their world to be able to make objective judgments based upon the, the information that's submitted. So uh, we try to have a, a local business person and or a parent who has some experience in that realm. So in this case, we had a, a, a local person. We almost always have a city of Silverton representative when we have a project that will involve the city of Silverton, either via communication or permitting or whatever, whatever it may be. And then we rely upon our staff. So Joel Smallwood, who's very well qualified as well, uh, and myself, and we typically put a, a principal or another person uh, on the community as well. In this case, there were five people on the community that served this purpose. Any discussion on this? Sounds like a thorough process. <clears throat> okay, moving along, statement of qualification, ZCS Engineering of Oregon City for Butte Creek and Scotts Mill Schools seismic upgrade projects. And we also talked about this in our packet, it's about a um, proposal, do you just want to take this one, Andy? Yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> you're, uh, you're a very busy school district with the facilities you have, that you have been for quite a while and will continue to be, no doubt. Uh, and two of those, of course, are specific to Butte Creek School and Scotts Middle School, the seismic upgrades from the revenue of the state seismic grants that you qualified for. And the, I believe it's a benefit, uh, and, and so it's being placed in front of you, not for a decision tonight, but to create an awareness so the decision can be made at a subsequent meeting. That you you are in a unique position in that you have an engineering firm who you've contracted with in the past for the full um, uh, seismic evaluation of all schools in the district, including Scotts Mills and Deep Creek School, and who did quite a bit of investigative research and also submitted the state seismic grant on your behalf. If if you were to uh, do a more traditional approach, and let's say start as you would have with a, with a project from scratch and go out and submit requests for proposals, uh, which is an option. I want to make that real clear. But it's also an, an option that would likely take you, well, it would take you uh, fairly significant extra time because you'd have to redo some of the work that's already been completed by this, this engineering firm. Uh, and, and, and the way that the, there's actually state statute and even uh, an OAR specific to this process that allows you as the local contract review board to say, do we have a circumstance where, where a, an entity, a, a contractor has done a, a, enough quality work for, so that you can take that information and make a decision that is in the best interest of the public based upon the engineer that has submitted the information to you. It's, it's a continuation of the project is the way that it's, it's reviewed. And it's a process that puts you in a position of saying, let's take a look at the facts, statement of qualifications. Let's summarize those facts through a document called Findings a Fact, which is a document that based upon your conversation tonight, I would work with ECS Engineering and Joel, and we would have that produced for you to review uh, at your next meeting. Uh, and then, assuming you, you as a local contract board approve the findings of fact, we would take that information and you publish it in, in the Daily Journal of Commerce. Again, everything is very much open and, and uh, available for public review. And in this case, the public review is really to do a couple of things, to demonstrate that you believe that it's going to be a cost-saving measure, that you're going to be able to save some money in, in the long run by doing this simply because you're not going to have to repeat some of the practices already. That it's an impartial process. You're not showing any favoritism to anyone. And you have to demonstrate that as a public entity. Uh, and in this case, uh, I believe it's reasonable for you to do that. You've used this process on a number of occasions in the past. Uh, most recently, I can think of when we installed the, um, uh, the uh, remote control devices, uh, um, thermostat control devices, oh, there's Earth. Uh, in each of your schools, you did a very similar process. <coughs> okay, Irv. Irv, are you awake? Uh, more awake. 
Can you see us all right, Irv? I can see you, okay. I finally had to resort to my phone. I could not get my laptop to work, though. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, we'll keep an eye on you and make sure you're still there. And we can, we can, can you guys hear him okay? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's a, that, that's a brief summary of, of the, the process itself. It does take, um, you approve the finding of facts or at least have that as an option at your next meeting. And then assuming, uh, and then once you had additional public input, if there was any public input about this decision, you would make a, a final con contractual decision at your April meeting. And then we would be able to move ahead. And I think this is such, it is a time sensitive project. We, we do want to, want to get both of these projects started as soon as possible. Uh, the funds for the the um, for the grants should be available for uh, district access uh, sometime in late March or early April. So it's it's about the same time frame. Andy, what's the scope of work for ZCS? Is it just engineering and design, or is it construction management as well? They would be doing construction management as well. Okay. Yeah, and, and I should point out there are two representatives from ZCS in the, in the audience tonight. Uh, Zach and Russ are, are here, so if you have any specific questions of them, I know they'd be happy. Well, they're, yeah, they're they're all they're familiar with with both projects, and that kind of makes sense. And maybe this really isn't a question about this, but how, how does this process work? It's a grant, so is there where's the incentive for us to try to save money on this? For instance, if it's a thing like this, you know, for instance, I was in the Scott, we were in the Scotts Mill gym, did the chili pd here tonight, and just were, people were talking about it and. People were did a little math and and and, and, and there's more maybe there's, you know I, I, I got dig into it but we got a gym that's five thousand square feet and it's close to a million dollars in grant well that's two hundred bucks a square foot and you can turn to build a brand new gym for that and I'm trying to figure that out how do we do due diligence to try to make sure we save the money but but it's a grant so if we if we hold our feet to the fire and we keep it down to $790,000, what do we do with the saved money? It just goes back to the state. So yeah, we don't save the money unless Exactly, we so how do we how do we save that? You know, do you see where kind of the, the dilemma I'm kind of wondering? Sure. Um, and I don't know if this is the proper time to discuss that, but sure. but I'm trying to think of what's our incentive to, to I think that project just got through like 950, you know, what's our incentive to try to knock that down to 850 or something? Sure. Or it, it just seemed like, 200 bucks a square foot to rebuild a gym, and maybe there's more to it in outbuildings, maybe there's some attached buildings I didn't realize, but that was just trying to understand this this process going forward. Yeah, um, I can, and, I, and I can't com com or comment on any of the technical aspects yeah, of it, other than yeah. uh, the, the word that you use, at least from my perspective, and board members, I, I hope you chime in, but is, is, it is a matter of due diligence and, and your responsibility as, as a board to ensure right. that the dollars are being used appropriately and that you're doing everything you can to to be certain that's in place, right, uh, right, and so relying upon a, a qualified uh, company who has a, a great yeah. track record experience to do that, I think is a good first step. But second to that, making certain that we ask the right questions, uh, making certain that uh, yes. if, that you receive frequent reports as a board about, about yeah. progress, and uh, and that you're also making yourselves available on site to see what's what's occurring. Yeah, well, it's, I guess it's my comments, probably my, my question is probably more a comment on the grant process and not DCS. Just sure. The process. Okay, so. Well, maybe I can follow up with a quick question yeah. about the grant process because my assumption would be is that the grant application itself is real detailed as far as scope, uh, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. But that's yeah. my that's assumption as far as scope, and then also putting numbers to that. And then I would assume that the people awarding the grant are reviewing that for uh, you know to see whether or not that that meets um, you know current current. Uh, uh, Construction costs and are similar, you know, similar types of activities and things like that that they've experienced. So that they're not just relying on, you know, we need a, a million dollars and hand it out. Yeah. But yeah. I, so I would guess that's my assumption is that that occurs. Yes. Uh, Zach, did you have a comment? Yeah, I, yeah, I think I can shed some light on the process in its entirety. Yeah. The district hired us to prepare grant applications. Those applications weren't just your standard grant application where you fill out a sheet of paper and send it in and it's evaluated based on arbitrary requirements. We went through and we toured each facility, drew up yeah. as-built drawings based on what's actually there. 
came up with uh, schematic retrofit plans. We, we've actually got plans for each of the facilities that aren't done in their entirety uh, by any means. There's still a lot of work to be done, but it was enough to convey the intent of the grant funds to, uh, to the selection board and also to develop anticipated construction costs. Mm -hmm. uh, with Scotts Mill specifically, the intent was initially just to focus on the gym. Throughout the grant process <coughs> and our evaluation of the entire facility and the amount of money that we came up with for the gym specifically, at the last minute we decided to alter the, the submission essentially and include the rest of the facility also. So there's more work happening throughout the campus. Uh, the seismic deficiencies there weren't substantial right. compared to the gymnasium, but we thought, heck, if we can still get a good rating and make a qualified application based on the higher value, then the more money for the district, the better. Well, yeah. so, so those those funds then are awarded by the dip, or by the grant selection committee based on the anticipated construction costs that are part of the grant application. Um, and really any cost savings that, that can be had go back into the facility. Um, we wouldn't want to see a bunch of money going back to the state when it's been awarded to the district. Uh, we try and keep our design fees as low as we can, knowing that budget deficits are what they are. Every dollar counts, especially when you can spend it on, on the facilities that you've got. And, uh, while it's specific money for seismic rehabilitation, there are other parts of the project where we're coming back in and maybe we have to put a new roof on something because we have to tear it off um, to perform the seismic rehabilitation. There's a lot of facets of um, where the money's spent, how the money's spent, but through our initial evaluation and document generation, we really come up with a a firm uh, cost estimate that we feel is appropriate. No, that's you, you answered my question. It, it isn't the gym; it's the gym and <clears throat> other structures. Yeah, perfect. Okay. And yeah, and, and so I guess <clears throat> if there's whatever, if there's money saved here, you can continue to spend more throughout the building. Exactly. Good. Okay. Perfect. I'll be anxious to see the findings of fact. I think there's a couple advantages on the surface. It's pretty clear. One is schedule. Um, CS understands the scope and can jump in relatively quickly. And the other one is they have ownership of the scope right now. Mm -hmm. Or if you bring another contractor and they don't have that ownership, then I think we're more likely to see RFIs and changes to scope. Yeah, to me it makes total sense to keep them on board and use this process to, to have them keep going with the process and do the work. And thank you guys for your work on the grant. and. I mean, for us yeah, to get both grants is amazing. Thank you. So publicly, thank you. thank you guys for for that and for what you did. That, that's awesome. Thank you. And then in this grant, I assume there's report back requirements, reporting back to the state and the selection committee or whoever it is there that receives how we spent the money. And uh, I'm sure you guys have lots of experience Absolutely. doing that for this particular grant. They have regular progress reports. We we were side by side with the. Uh, with the overseers of the grant, very familiar with the process. We've been through it many times. So just to comment, this is a beautiful production. This actually is not the Lakeview High School. This is Daly Middle, Middle School. I went to seventh grade there. It's a 1920s era unreal forest brick building, three stories, uh, still in service today, thanks to the work of Folks like you. We actually worked on both. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. <laughs> I saw the uh, uh, Fremont Elementary. I, I see the window where I spent my second grade. <laughs> so, <laughs> we had a tension room. We had a uh, no, actually, we had a chicken in the classroom that year, so we could learn about uh, biology and birth. <laughs> Calling Christina the marketing director first thing in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is a little bit unrelated, but since we've got you here, a question that's been uh, crossed my mind and, uh, for quite some time now is when you reinforce some of these older uh, unreinforced masonry buildings and make them earthquake safe, does an earthquake still, I mean, uh, this is, I know I'm speaking real generalities here, but my thought was is the earthquake still destroys that masonry 
what is now maybe more veneer, or maybe it's not veneer, but it's less structural. And it's, so it still destroys that, and you have a major expense then, or maybe you've actually got to destroy a building, as opposed to a brand new building that's built to earthquake code. I know I've seen the buildings built in Japan on giant springs, and I know we don't do that here, but I'm thinking relative to spending a lot of money to reinforce or, or restore an old building like we have at Schlater Street or even Eugene Field School. Uh, are we at risk down the line that we have a huge expense uh, to re you know, repair this building or have an unrepairable building? Um, it's the difference between, if you have the resources to go through and replace all your buildings <coughs> and bring them up to current earthquake codes, um, then that's, that's what we do. Most districts can't. So this money is the next best thing. It's collapse prevention. Um, some of the a lot of schools in the state, if we get a code earthquake, they're going to collapse, and there's mm -hmm. going to be loss of life. So this grant money is to um, extend the life of the buildings, get them through an event should we have one. Uh, will the buildings be useful afterwards? Some of them sure, some of them will not. Will be uh, they'll be emptied. Uh, all the occupants will get out safely, and then you'll knock them down. Um, but the, the thinking behind it is this whole program is to raise awareness that we do have this problem, to extend the life of some of these older buildings for districts that don't have the resources to go through and, and upgrade their inventory. So. Yeah, and I was thinking, I guess, specifically of the Eugene Field building. You know, there's been a big discussion in the community about whether it should be uh, refurbished or whether it should be, you know, replaced. And that was one thing that never, never came up, and it certainly never crossed my mind of, you know, when we're making that decision between spending X amount of dollars to refurbish it and maybe more dollars to replace it, do we have this liability hanging out there? I'm, I'm guessing it'd be impossible to get earthquake insurance on a building that's still a terracotta or a masonry building. Um, you know, and we're looking at an earthquake probability of a certain percentage over the next so many years. Uh, it just occurred to me that you spend that 10 or 12 million dollars to refurbish it and then you have an earthquake and you've lost that entire investment potentially and I don't know if that's right thinking or not but if you <clears throat> uh, I suppose if you passed a you know a district bond right and the district ponied up the money for it that's a that's a, a that's a good discussion okay. uh, but the grant program is sure. here. Here's some here's some free money. Do the, do your best with it while you have it to right. extend the life of these schools. Perhaps while you while that is raising awareness in your community to perhaps pass some bonds and get some money to modernize your schools so we don't have a problem. Um, sure. But mm -hmm. I, I understand where you're coming from. But it's a the the basic uh, philosophy is. Um, a, a, a destroyed building that doesn't collapse is better than a, a school full of kids in a building that does. Sure. And it's not money out of your pocket. So, and again, it's to it's just to raise awareness that we have this problem, and there should be school districts. You know, that, well, we, not everybody not everybody gets this grant money. Uh, uh, the community should be aware that it is a problem. School bonds should be pursued to fix the problems. Antiquated schools are, some of them are just intolerable. A lot of them, a lot of districts we had to turn away because we couldn't do anything with some of their buildings because the, the cap on the grant's only a million and a half per facility and you can only do so much with it. So. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Are, are you referring to the, there's, isn't there, there's type one or type two <coughs> earthquake? Am I, am I, there's there's the there's the type of code that says if the code event occurs the building is still usable like a fire hall you want you want it to work where and then there's a life safety standard that says everyone's going to get out mm -hmm. alive but the building is destroyed so how, how many brand new school buildings if 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 you if, if we're building a brand new school building are those all Required to be usable after the earthquake? Not necessarily. How many? How many are? I'm just. Well, there's. You're, you're here. It's an interesting discussion. With that. I'm just going to follow. Well, up. we we just designed uh, a 
new elementary school with <coughs> your new architect you selected, mm -hmm. Dow IBA. Um, there are, uh, in the structural design code, um, schools are a special occupancy. So we take our design force loads and forces and we multiply them by uh, an importance factor. S school full of people all day long has a little bit higher importance, so we bump up the loads. Not, not necessarily for reoccupancy and and start school the next day. Um, fire departments and police stations, their weight, they're they're much higher even because we want to be able to go right back in and go back to work. They're essential facilities. Schools aren't. Uh, you could expect a brand new school designed properly, built properly to sustain a lot of damage in a code earthquake. It doesn't fall down. It, you may be able to fix it, salvage it. Um, the damage probably won't be nearly as much as an antiquated building that's been retrofit, but it's going to get beat up too. And as far as the insurance question goes, we've insured or have helped clients get buildings insured that have gone through this uh, seismic rehabilitation. Um, I, I'm I'm not so quick to say that that's an uninsurable situation. So. Hmm. Thank you. Interesting. <clears throat> okay. Anything else on this then? Still with us, sir? Can you hear? Nope. Okay. Okay. Last discussion item: Joint Silverton City Council Silver Falls School Board meeting, March 16th. Our next work session will be a, um, a joint work session with them. Any ideas on things you'd like to? talk about with the city council, other than getting them to buy food for us. <laughs> I'll work on that. No, Andy and I are supposed to meet with the city manager and the mayor this week, I think. So um, anything you guys would like to see on the agenda for that joint meeting? Do we have any leverage for revisiting the SRO that they used to help pay for? We could talk about that. At least I'd like to know. We could have a discussion how how it would work and yeah. how they're going to service each of the schools. And what was the what was the previous agreement before? The, before were they covering it? Were they covering it all? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, they were oh, they were. They were one hundred percent. Okay. And then was it was it kind of a horse trade? Was it one of those things where you know we're kind of the Silverton City of Silverton's public green space? We take care of the green. Was it? You know what was the what was the, the the original kind of agreement? They're providing the SRO, and we you know we're trying to see if there's a we have a huge we have a huge population at the high school, so it's a yeah, well, all three schools. I mean, but but he was there was was he was was that SRO at the high school all day long, or was he? Can I address that? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah the, and the SRO was specific to the town schools. Uh, spent a predominant amount of time at, at Silverton High School, but and secondarily at Mark Twain and Robert Frost in Eugene mm -hmm. Field. Funded fully by the city, it was part of the uh, chief of police, who happens to be the current mayor, uh, community policing initiative, uh, and so it made sense from that standpoint for for, for the, the police department to have a positive uh, relationship with many of the kids in the community, and then that would extend into the evening, weekends, summertime, spring break, and so forth. And that I believe was the yeah. was the, the, the purpose and uh, their approach. Anyway. Yeah. And then the money just ran out. Yeah, no, I've always just heard about these about these horse trades that kind of go right. on between yeah. the district and the, and I'm just trying to make sure it's still in balance. You know? right. Anyway, I don't know, I don't know the history of these horse trades that sure. I'm referring to, so I'd like to know like more. <laughs> so. so we'll talk about the SRO funding and things yeah. like that, how that will work. Anything else? Okay. We think of something we can... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'll communicate with you. Okay. Do you have a chance to Please about Eugene Field Absolutely. of what to do with that building? I mean, we're moving out of it. Is that a conversation that the city would be a part of? I'm sure that's it? something that that's something we had already kind that's of. On, that's on the list currently, too. Yeah, it's already on the list. So, so there's any interest there. So. Okay, sounds good. So, we'll just have a question. Will we be seeing a, a list of the topics that we're going to discuss prior to this meeting in advance? I mean, 
prior to your regular uh, prior to our joint meeting prior to the regular packet to schedule though david if we you get it the, be the, the regular agenda the packet, the so, okay. yeah as long as we have time to absolutely adjust and yeah about it. yeah we'll get, nice it, we'll get it the week before i know it'll okay. be an early draft but what, what you have down just put our packet for next meeting okay Okay, we can do that. That's the first cut. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And it's and it's oh, sorry, John Remedy. Yeah. It's yeah. it's detail of semantics possibly, it's, but it's a, it's a city council meeting. It's not a Silver Falls school board meeting, so it'll be their agenda. So their but I'll, we'll we'll draft something to put in your packet as well for sure. Okay. 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 Moving on to action items. First one: approve Dawa IBI Group of Portland as architect for the Schlater project. Is there a motion? Move so, for approval. Second. Moved and seconded. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, passes. And the second action item we're adding tonight, declare zone five vacant for the May election. Is there a motion? I move that, that the board does declare zone five vacant under ORS chapter 332 for the May election. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Good. We will move out of regular session. We'll take a five minute break, move out of regular session, and adjourn to executive session under RS 192660 personnel records.